I'm so I'd like to welcome all of you to I think it's now the fourth uh, LTC COVID webinar and uh, we are going to take a pause next week and we will then um, announce the timing of the next one. Part of the reason for the pause is because next week at exactly the same time there is a webinar of the Alzheimer's Society and uh, it seems a very good idea not to be competing with them and uh, also it's, it will give us a bit more time to think a bit more about which issues to cover and what to discuss. So I'd like to uh, welcome all of you. I'd like to thank the speakers today. Um, it's fantastic that you've all agreed to participate and I'm really delighted that we have a really good combination of learning from somebody's personal experience of the impact of COVID and living with dementia. We then have an overview provided um, of, of, of issues uh, that are arising internationally. We will then hear more um, particularly about the challenges of continuing to provide, uh, for example, cognitive stimulation therapy during uh, the COVID pandemic. We'll then hear about the experiences in Kenya, and then we'll uh, go on to hear about the work of Ozamazis International and the NGOs in supporting people with dementia during the pandemic. So I think we have an amazing overview, but also means it's a packed program, so we'll be very sharp with the presentations, but we will have, as usual, half an hour at the end for open discussion so if you have any questions for any speakers, please hold them or write them in the comment box in the chat and we'll get back to you as soon as we have finished with all the presentations. So welcome all and first of all I'd like to introduce Peter Middleton who knows everything about living with dementia in the pandemic. He's very much an expert in the matter and some people may have even seen him in a recent Channel 4 documentary. So Peter, Flori, viewers, that love would be very interested to hear about how you have found all this. Well, uh, hello everyone, uh, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Peter Middleton, and I have dementia. I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease around 18 months ago, but like many others, I spent more than two years wrongly diagnosed with anxiety and depression. It took an MRI scan to discover the shrinkage in my brain as I have always passed memory tests with high marks. Now I'm retired and I live on the edge of a small town called Burton Latimer in England with my wife, Pam, who is also my carer. The COVID-19 pandemic arrived like a whirlwind in the middle of March and turned my life upside down. It upset my comfortable routine, severely limiting my contact with the outside world as I went into isolation. I usually do a lot of volunteer work in my local community and speaking engagements to explain how I live with dementia. It keeps my mind sharp and active. But now I'm having to find new and novel ways to achieve the same mental stimulation. And I've taken to writing a blog and I've been keeping a video diary that has recently formed part of a television documentary about lockdown. But not all of us who live with dementia are able to do these things. I know that the carers of people deeper into dementia than myself are finding it very difficult to provide mental stimulation for those in their care in the absence of the regular community groups and events that they usually attend. And I know that others are struggling with mental health issues and domestic violence exacerbated by the lockdown. My wife Pam is also a carer for adults with special needs, so she is often out of the house for 48 hours at a time leaving me totally isolated. During these times, unless I'm lucky enough to have a web conversation or a telephone call from one of the people in the Alzheimer's Society, I speak to no one. I have noticed that my speech has deteriorated somewhat and that when speaking with my wife, I have begun to stumble over my words, unable to finish the sentence, sometimes leaving long silences while I search for a word to express a thought. Often I forget to eat. I forget to take my medication. I'm insulin dependent. Uh, I'm a diabetic. I forget what I went into a room for, what day it is, and what I've just been doing. It's difficult to access outside help and services too. Many phone lines are understaffed or closed, and face-to-face -face meetings are a thing of the past. It can be a daunting prospect for someone like me to have to access these services. Last week, I had some difficulty managing my blood sugar levels. The only way that I could access 
my diabetic nurse was by telephone and it was very hard for me to explain my problem without the extra signals offered by face-to-face -face contact. I left the conversation angry with myself and frustrated that I had wasted both of our time by not putting my problem across properly. I am trapped in limbo, waiting until I am told that I can rejoin society. I feel that the isolation is accelerating my decline. I feel useless and purposeless. I feel helpless. And while I've been locked away, the world has been rapidly changing. There are new rules, new etiquettes and new social structures that I'm going to have to adapt to, the new normal as it's being called. People with dementia like routine. We like to be in our comfort zones. And the thought of visiting a shop for the first time after lockdown frightens me. Where will I queue? How will I queue? What are the new ways of doing things that I've uh, uh, doing things that I've gotten used to for so many years? What if I have trouble speaking? Will the people behind me become impatient? Am I doing everything right? People like me are trapped in a bubble while the world changes and adapts around us. And worse, for us the clock is ticking, and every day we spend in isolation is a day further down the road into dementia. I had hoped to spend this summer spending some quality time with my wife, storing up memories while I'm still able. But the pandemic has stolen my chance of this happiness, as we have had to cancel the holiday we had long planned. However, I'm an optimist, and I'm looking forward to next spring and hoping that I'm still aware enough to do all the things I planned for this year. Well, thank you for listening to me. I see it as my duty to describe my journey. Uh, while I'm still articulate enough to do it. And I wanted you to understand a little of, of what it's like to live in the shoes of someone who is living with dementia. And I hope I've been able to give you a small insight into the world that I now inhabit since contracting Alzheimer's disease and how the pandemic has changed it. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have during the time available at the end of the webinar. Thank you very much, Peter. And uh, thank you so much for setting all the issues that we will of course now try to to also discuss in in terms of data but your your experience is is helps us really put it in context thank you so much so we will now then change a bit the program and we are now going to hear from gloria wong from the university of hong kong on cognitive stimulation and delivering it online thank you so much gloria Thank you so much, uh, Adelina, for inviting me to uh, share our ideas about delivering uh, CST online. So, um, uh, and especially thanks to uh, Peter, because uh, what you said is um, the perfect introduction to our idea. So, um, uh, a little bit of background. I think I think this slide is actually now no need because uh, we heard from Peter directly about uh, why uh, we need a kind of social connection during the lockdown period. And um, while we know that people with dementia, they are at a higher risk of infection in general, not just during the COVID-19. Uh, and also uh, isolation and, and in care homes, visitation restrictions have been very important to protect life and health. Uh, but at the same time, it is uh, having a lot of negative impact in terms of uh, worsening cognition and symptoms and, also, and more importantly, loneliness and the depression that can result from it. And also the burden on carers. So um, while the rest of the world, uh, like us, we are uh, uh, trying to maintain some kind of normal social connection through uh, uh, ICT, through the uh, information communication technology, and also uh, there are increasing use of e-mental health service uh, during the um, COVID-19. But these have not been widely applied in um, dementia care services, uh, mainly because as uh, professionals and, and scholars are having a lot of worry about whether people with uh, dementia because of the 
uh, mental capacity, whether whether it would be too confusing for people with dementia to use this kind of uh, Zoom technology and also worry about whether the uh, level of uh, IT literacy would enable them to use this uh, technology. But um, uh, having said that, uh, on a side note, uh, you may be uh, uh, you may have heard about uh, Professor Charles Cow, uh, who is uh, uh, called the father of uh, uh, fiber optic. And um, during his later life, he actually suffered from Alzheimer's disease. And uh, he and his wife devoted uh, most of their later life uh, to promote um, care service for dementia. And I'm thinking um, it would only do justice to him that we uh, make sure that people with dementia and their family benefit from this uh, technology. So um, a little bit of background of why we are thinking about CST in applying uh, this kind of technology. So um, for those of you who may not be uh, familiar with this, uh, this is actually the um, only non-drug treatment that has been recommended by uh, UK uh, government guidelines and also international reports. Uh, and the important point is it's not intended to be like a uh, treatment that uh, is a test of ability, but it is intended to be an enjoyable social experience. And it is because of the uh, very well established evidence on its effect on both cognition as well as quality of life, and also uh, that it is uh, Quite, uh, it is cost effective um, that it has been recommended and, and now it is um, implemented worldwide. Um, so uh, in, in uh, countries like uh, Germany uh, and Italy uh, and also in Hong Kong, we have translated it. And uh, so it seems that it is something that can be applied across culture with the same effectiveness. So uh, um, in in general, uh, CST is delivered in a group setting so that people with dementia uh, can interact with uh, one another in a small group and uh, they will go through the standard protocol is 14 sections of theme activity uh, delivered twice weekly uh, and also there are um, uh, protocols of maintenance CST and also individual CST delivered at home. So uh, this is uh, a brief idea about what CST is, but more importantly, it is about the uh, key principles and the themes that is important about CST. So as you can see in um, this slide, um, the major principles of CST include uh, both mental stimulation about uh, learning something new and, and engaging in some activities that are mentally stimulating, as well as uh, person-centeredness and also uh, ensuring that the social interaction is a enjoyable one. And uh, about the 14 section, you could see that uh, actually uh, variability, variety is important so that uh, each section there are new themes uh, introduced. So uh, with these principles and the themes, um, uh, we uh, at the University of Hong Kong are collaborating with UCL. Uh, so we are thinking that actually um, these can well be delivered through an online platform with some minor modification. And in fact, uh, so um, the background to this idea is uh, we have had this idea way before the COVID-19 outbreak because um, the thinking is that, is that while CST is being uh, implemented worldwide, there are a lot of people having no access to this intervention uh, due to mobility issues, due to logistic challenges uh, of uh, being able to find a group uh, in, in somewhere nearby the home. So we thought of this idea of using technology like Zoom to connect people uh, with similar cultural background, language, and also interest beyond the geographic boundary. And while we were thinking and planning and, and, and thinking about how to modify the sessions, we were hit by the COVID-19. And, and my team who are here would, would know that we regret so much that we didn't uh, hurry it up before, before the COVID-19 um, uh, caught us. But luckily, um, 
uh, in the community, the response has been very quick. So uh, today, I, I, uh, what I could share with you is some of the um, pilot that our NGO partners have tried in, in their uh, service. So this is uh, the photo that you see here is actually a TV program reporting um, the uh, online CST service uh, provided by a, a day, dementia day center. So uh, if you could see here, um, the two facilitators are uh, doing some kind of reality orientation uh, through Zoom and in the in, in the other end of the Zoom chat, you could see there are um, four clients in their own home joining in. Uh, and uh, one of the main lessons learned is that actually we, we perhaps uh, worry too much that uh, people with dementia, mild or moderate dementia, they coped well. They didn't, so uh, we were worried that if they will be confused uh, because of the Zoom and all, all sorts of different um, uh, video settings, but uh, they they uh, interact fine, and also most of these people have no prior ICT experience, and we have just um, let me show you this picture. So this in this photo, this is a uh, 1992-year-old lady who is new to Zoom, and she said that actually she's very interested in learning about this. And we also heard some uh, positive feedback from carers uh, saying that the person with dementia have improved mood because of this um, uh, service. And also an interesting point that we heard from people with dementia is that they, they feel excited about uh, the chance of uh, uh, getting in touch with this kind of technology. They said that they feel like a celebrity. So this is some new learning for us too. So uh, uh, as in CST, we emphasize novelty and enjoyable uh, experience. And it is exactly what um, ICT could deliver to, to them. Uh, uh, Gloria, you have that, about, also... Gloria, you have about okay. one minute, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll hurry up. Yeah. So, uh, but we also uh, noticed a, a number of things that we need to pay attention to, like the uh, energy level, attention level, and also the technical uh, support that is needed. So in this photo, um, uh, one of the NGO uh, actually prepared a video uh, guide to how to set up uh, an IPEC for, for family carers. And I'll just be quick. So there are also some design modification needed, which I won't go into detail, but uh, actually we can overcome the need of uh, uh, having physical interaction. Uh, and also with uh, online technology, we can, we can have a lot of different possibility, like uh, in the activity, we can ask our uh, participant to identify where can they find roses like this in Hong Kong. Uh, so um, a number of next steps that we are preparing, but uh, because of time, I won't go into detail, but I want to highlight one thing is that actually because of the COVID-19, it is a good lesson for us to notice that there have been a lot of inequality in terms of IT access. As Peter mentioned that actually we have been uh, leaving people with dementia and older people behind because of our technology advance. And I, I think it is the best opportunity that we address this inequality. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gloria. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so uh, next we're going to hear from Christine Wissimi, who I have the pleasure to work with in the STRIDE project. Hi, Christine. Hi, everyone. Um, good to see everyone of you. And uh, some of you are not on video, but at least I can see a number. We're almost 100. And it's just good to hear about the technology that's already affecting us. And uh, I'm about to share that uh, shortly on the impact of um, technology impact uh, of COVID-19 on persons with uh, dementia and their caregivers. Thank you, Adenila, for inviting me. And uh, I'll just go ahead and do the presentation and tell you what's about, give you a background about Kenya before I delve into the specific context of um, or the impact of COVID-19. Can you all see my screen? Yes, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Okay, great. So um, uh, it's very well known uh, from, of course, um, uh, the 2015 Alzheimer's report that uh, in Africa, the prevalence of uh, dementia for those that are above 60 years is about 6%. 
But uh, looking at the recent uh, systematic review conducted by the STRIDE team revealed that there is no published um, study on the prevalence of dementia in Kenya. But uh, in 2016, um, about 3,205 were attributed to dementia, deaths were attributed to dementia. So despite the lack of evidence on, um, uh, on the prevalence of dementia, there are still deaths that have been attributed to uh, dementia. And this showed an increase from 1990 to 2026, which was about 15%. So despite this uh, challenge also, um, Kenya relies exclusively uh, on informal caregiving uh, and these are uh, family caregivers uh, because the health systems are not well structured to efficiently handle uh, dementia care. So um, I'll start by just giving you about um, the government regulations that have been brought about by COVID-19. And uh, I'll just mention the few that are relevant to um, persons or that are affecting persons with dementia and their caregivers. So we had um, a curfew that has been there for about two months and it has been moved from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. and from 9, 5 a.m. to 4 a.m. While it is a good thing, we still have people or persons with dementia sometimes getting lost. And if they are found uh, outside the, um, uh, you know, past curfew hours, then there's a risk of penalty or being quarantined. Uh, quarantined. So um, sometimes uh, we've also been, in, um, like in many, many other countries, there's a, a national public wearing of, of masks. And sometimes you can even be arrested while in your private vehicle as long as you're two. So sometimes you're just forced to be on masks. So this is not just for persons with dementia, but anyone. There's also a physical distance of about 1.2, uh, 1.5 meters um, in public uh, gatherings or public uh, settings. And then um, caregivers and everyone in Kenya, as uh, there was a suggestion to work from home. And in Kenya and in other African countries, the context for working from home is not very streamlined. So there are issues with organizations and some people actually being laid off uh, because we don't have structures to work from home. There are also restriction of social and public gatherings. So um, uh, uh, caregivers are not able to meet to share their experiences in term of, terms of peer-to-peer -peer support. And then um, there was also a lockdown in specific counties, although some was uh, sub-counties were um, uh, the lockdown was removed from some counties. Um, however, we have most of the counties that have been on lockdown are in, uh, based in uh, urban cities. So you will find if uh, someone needs to visit in the rural areas and needs to visit someone with dementia, then they're not able to visit because of the lockdown. And um, yeah, I was just speaking about the government regulations that have affected persons with dementia and their carers. And uh, despite these um, um, uh, regulations, the impact is a bit negative sometimes. And uh, when people are found outside the curfew hours, there are penalties, there is a fine, or you're being quarantined and the facilities are not very um, conducive. Sometimes you put in a facility and the risk of infection is actually higher. If you look at the photo we have, um, this is a Kenyan photo where the police are you know, employing violence and this is someone who was found uh, past uh, 7 p.m. Uh, the curfew hours. Next slide, please. Um, so in the next few slides, I'll just be sharing about the impact of COVID-19 on persons with uh, dementia and uh, carers. Next slide, please. Thank you. So um, there's actually a number of things that have affected uh, persons with dementia and their carers. And uh, sometimes we have uh, persons with dementia, sometimes they have difficulties remembering the government rules on keeping distance, having to put on a mask and in the right um, uh, way. Sometimes you might forget and you know, uh, maybe get out of the house without a mask and, mask and then you stand, uh, you, you, you're at risk of um, uh, 
uh, being uh, uh, arrested. So there are legal implications also because, again, as I mentioned, is you're found past a few hours, you're arrested or you're quarantined. And then uh, sometimes uh, people, uh, because of the lockdown in some counties, uh, people, uh, for example, in the rural areas will feel anxious or they will feel they have been abandoned because they are not being visited. And then uh, sometimes because uh, the carers are now more regularly at home, then uh, there is close proximity and so close interaction. And so next, next slide, uh, uh, Adelina. Uh, so it, when it comes to these interactions and if there are issues of uh, 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 maybe giving an instruction, um, there might be some tension uh, when it comes to that kind of interaction because especially when you're repeating instructions um, or, or there might be some conflict or a physical abuse uh, from either party, so you will realize it's such a, a, a big issue in Kenya. And uh, people are, are also worried of visiting the hospital because of the risk of infection of COVID-19. Or sometimes because of um, the lockdown, then uh, someone who has dementia or their care, they'll imagine maybe someone, a relative or a loved one, will, uh, will you know, they, they, they fear of losing a loved one who is in a lockdown county. And then uh, caregivers have also been um, exposed to um, salary cuts, they've been um, uh, exposed to um, issues of, you know, losing their jobs. And so they experience um, economic challenges uh, in the families. And so they're not able to provide uh, for medication and food on the table. Carers also experience burnout and distress. And uh, um, so one of the solutions that um, the Alzheimer's uh, Dementia Organization of Kenya is doing is to engage the caregivers to uh, online to uh, try and share their experiences, give them information on COVID-19 and how they can be able uh, to support each other during this pandemic. But again, there are also issues of poor connectivity. You might realize most of the time, the apology conversation like we just had, um, <laughs> Can you hear me? Uh, you know, um, sorry, come up again. I didn't hear what you said. So you realize most of the time, uh, much of the time is being taken to, uh, you know, instead of going straight away to the uh, content, then discussions are around, you know, trying to connect. And then there's also issues of online fatigue. So sometimes the sessions are long, uh, but in addition to that, sessions that are long co uh, combined with poor connectivity, then it becomes really uh, an issue of, uh, you know, am I really to, going to stay in this conversation for such a long time and retain my you know, concentration? So sometimes it becomes a burden to the caregivers as well. Next slide, please. Adelina, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so this is my concluding slide. And while I'm saying that technology is not, um, I'm not saying that technology should not be used because it can reduce distress among caregivers during those discussions. And it can also be used as um, uh, reminders or, and also in terms of when to take medication and also for social activities that may not be available, may not be provided during this season. So, uh, but it comes with challenges that uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, and especially uh, older persons in Kenya are not very good with technology. So it's important to look at what aspects to include uh, when it comes to technology in order to address the needs of older persons. There are also financial challenges because many of them are not able to pro, uh, buy internet for, for, uh, for th this kind of discussions. As I mentioned, there's online fatigue and also security issues. So it's important even as we are employing technology-based um, uh, solutions, then we identify ways of addressing any challenges. And that's up to Gloria and the team for coming up with a very uh, good way of uh, uh, sharing this kind of intervention to persons with dementia and their caregivers, even way before uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the, the next slide is just about, um, Adelina, next slide, please. It's probably slow on my end, but just to give you, uh, uh, to make reference on where we got this information from, we based a stride article that was accepted on a systematic review 
Uh, so it's important to uh, just make reference in case you need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, if in case you need to get more, to, uh, in case you need to, you know, um, learn more about what's happening in Kenya in terms of uh, COVID-19 and dementia care in Kenya, you can um, log in through the LTC COVID website. Uh, the rest are the references. Uh, last slide, please. Oops. Uh I think I'm at yes. <laughs> okay, just to acknowledge the team, um, uh, the information um, uh, we have uh, information provided by a team from Africa Mental Health Research Foundation, from Alzheimer's and Dementia Organization, the STRIDE team, and of course LSC. Um, and if you need more information, our article is just there that can be found on ltc.org. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, now, because I'm already in charge of the slides, I'm going to move us to the presentation from Aida. And uh, thank you so much for emailing it. Aida, I cannot see you because I've got the slides on, but I'm assuming you're right. ready. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Great. Thank, thank, thank you. And I do apologize. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So I do apologize for the problem sharing my screen. So yes, thank you very much, all of you, for your patience. And um, maybe we can go straight to the next slide um, because, well, everybody knows already that I will be giving an overview on the situation of uh, COVID and dementia in the world. And this is uh, the outline of the talk. We'll be covering very briefly vulnerability to COVID infection in, uh, impact of the pandemic on this population and learning so far. So if you move to the next slide, uh, the next slide please. Um, we'll, yes, thank you. Well, um, it is very well known that around 50% of uh, all COVID-related deaths in many countries in the world correspond to people living in care homes. And since a large proportion of care home occupants are people living with dementia, it is expected that they also account for a large proportion of this debt. And I'll show you some figures supporting this notion now. Next slide. Uh, for instance, this is official data from the UK Office for National Statistics, which shows that 20% of all COVID deaths in April in England and Wales had a diagnosis of dementia which represents an 83% increase compared with the same period in the previous year. And in the next slide, um, you can see a similar picture, but this time from a region in North of Spain, where 41% uh, of all COVID-related deaths had a diagnosis of dementia. So next slide. Um, dementia itself does not increase the risk of contracting COVID, although the behavior of the person with dementia might do, because we all know that cognitive difficulties make more, um, more difficult to understand and comply with protective measures. And they are also a, a vulnerable population because people with dementia tend to be older, more likely to have associated comorbidities like vascular disease, more likely to develop uh, complications like delirium, and they experience greater functional loss during hospitalization. States. We already knew all that, but besides that, in the last few weeks, we've learned that there seem to be dementia-specific variables that influence the vulnerability to COVID infection. For instance, recent data that you are seeing in the screen suggests that there is a high prevalence of atypical presentations of COVID in people with dementia, which may reduce early recognition of symptoms and, and therefore uh, produce a delay in the provision of medical care. In this series of 82 people with COVID and dementia from two Italian hospitals, you can see that 67% of the cases presented with delirium, which is an atypical presentation for COVID. Next slide, please. And, uh, and it seems that people with dementia can also be more uh, predisposed to present, to have more severe COVID presentations. In that same Italian cohort, a diagnosis of dementia was independently associated with higher risks of death after correcting by age. And also, it seems that being a carrier of ApoE4, uh, which is uh, a very well-known risk factor for developing Alzheimer's disease, 
may also be associated with a severe COVID presentation. And lastly, in the next slide, um, COVID infections, we are learning that, that uh, produce neurological symptoms, and in particular, uh, they increase, apparently increase the risk of a stroke, and this may precipitate the cognitive decline of people with dementia. And these are just two examples that we are seeing um, how in the scientific literature we are seeing um, these same, the same facts reported from different cohorts uh, across the world. Next slide, please. And now I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, tell you a bit about the impact in the world um, in the life of people living with dementia and their access to healthcare. So when it comes to healthcare, we know that many specialized dementia clinics continued over phone or video conference in many countries in all continents uh, across the world since the lockdown started. However, in the next slide. Um, we also know that access to hospital care for people living in care homes was denied in many places. And this has had a direct impact on people living with dementia because they represent a large proportion of this population living in care homes and being denied care. And these are just a few examples of news about places where hospital transfer was refused for people living in care homes. And I just wanted to give you a taste of how global this problem has been. And these news are from England, Wales, Madrid, Ottawa, Sweden, and France. And in the next slide, um, here is to show you that also the protocols to access in the care in some countries, and this, the, we still don't have information about many countries, but we know that in some countries, the protocols to access intensive care establish criteria that place people with dementia at a disadvantage. And such concerning protocols, uh, we know that were issued in places like uh, Italy, the UK, Switzerland, and Spain, to name a few, but it is likely that this has happened in many other places. When it comes to the effects of con confinement, in the next slide, we know that um, the lockdown situation is taking a big toll on the cognitive and, and also the psychological health of people uh, with dementia living in the community, which is where the majority of people live. Because not only important routines have been interrupted and external sources of support suspended, but even basic support like home care services have been removed in many places. And a main barrier for essential care and therapeutic services to carry on has been, um, next slide please, the widespread lack of personal protection equipment. And also we need to consider that uh, this population experienced frequently psychological symptoms already as part of their condition, such as depression and anxiety. And these symptoms may be exacerbated as a result of confinement. And if we go to the next slide, uh, this is study is a proof of it. This is a very recent study on people with mild cognitive impairment and mild Alzheimer's disease, who after uh, five weeks within lockdown showed a significant worsening of symptoms of agitation, apathy, and wandering. Wandering is also called uh, walking with corpus. In the next slide, we have the other side of this story, which is people with dementia living in care homes who are at the very high top of the vulnerability scale because they are usually in more advanced stations, they have more severe symptoms, and they may experience deeper confusion. For instance, the ban on family visits is expected to have a devastating effect in their health because people cannot understand why their relatives no longer come to see them. The only thing they perceive is that they've been removed from very strong and grounding emotional bond. So increasing behaviors of challenge and mood disorders are expected in this situation. And likewise, changes in environment, like disruption in their home routines, or stuff looking odd, wearing the PPEs. And on top of all that, next slide, please. How do you effectively isolate no, the previous one, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> With the isolation. 
So how do you effectively isolate or quarantine someone with dementia without crossing harm? There is very little experience on how to do that, and there are unfortunately lots of efforts about an increased use of uh, chemical and physical restraint in care homes around the world at this moment. And this practice is not only against person-centered care, the, but it can also be dangerous uh, because COVID is primarily a respiratory disease and the use of practices that might cause uh, respiratory depression or render a person immobile may lead to adverse outcomes. So it is a bit concerning seeing in the next slide how the prescription for antipsychotics has increased since the pandemic started. This is data from UK. And in the next slide, we'll um, summarize very quickly. The, this is actually the most important part. This is the learnings and how we can do this better. So we've learned that when the health systems get overwhelmed in the world, people with dementia are the first to be left behind. So prioritize prevention and, and acting quickly uh, on places where there is a large density of people with dementia living together is very important. And the next slide is just to illustrate that uh, we, have, we, ha we have learned from the experience in Asian countries about how to do this very well. And when it comes to cognitive and psychological health, in the next slide, we know that continuity of support in the community is essential to maintain the cognitive and psychological health of people living with dementia. And this can be done in many different ways, uh, using a wide range of measures, such as um, warranting you know, PPA supply, using more telecare, issuing special policies, and redesigning activities and services. This can be done. And lastly, the expression is in the next slide. Next one. So there is a pressing need um, to provide compassionate um, confinement and isolation in the care home. So enabling visits of care partners and family in whatever its form is a priority. There are many examples of how to do this, uh, many creative and well-intended um, examples across the world. And also in the next slide, a, a topic of massive concern for me and for many other people, I'm sure, is uh, how to isolate someone with dementia who's been infected or maybe uh, may have been in contact with someone infected. So dementia is specific isolation care plans needs to be developed and implemented. And there are already a few examples in the literature of uh, compassionate isolation of people with dementia. So um, this can be done. There is proof that this can be done and we should be doing more of it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aida. And uh, next presentation is uh, Wendy Whitener from ADI, from Alzheimer's Disease International, and also a colleague of mine in the STRIDE project. I'm scared to try to share my slides. I'm going to do it. I'm going to try. Share my mm -hmm. slides. Okay. Starting at the end of my uh -huh. time. Let's go. <laughs> okay, do you see us? Yeah, we're in the last slide. Oh, yes, all working well. <laughs> okay, thank goodness. All right, so um, it's been thank you, Adelina, for inviting me to speak on, on, on behalf of the ADI and our members. And, and it's been great to hear everybody's views, really. And I think we sort of, our piece of the puzzle is really what we do with all of this, how we advocate for change. Um, and so I've got a lot of slides. I'm going to whip through some of the ones at the beginning. This is just an overview of ADI. Many of you will already know who we are. We're the Global um, Voice on Dementia. We're the umbrella organization for Alzheimer's um, associations globally. Um, and we have now 102 members. Um, the points I'm going to go through today are um, really about ADI's response to um, the COVID-19 and of our Alzheimer's association. Um, some of the emerging themes and concerns that we saw coming out, and sort of where do we go from here? Um, myself. There, I'm going to do that. Was I? No, can you still see? Okay. So, 
it became clear to us that our constituency, our group of people, our people living with dementia and carers of a certain age were very much at rest around COVID. And that we felt that there wasn't a lot of practical information for people that was out there. And then we were concerned also that governments, given the new situation, the new economic um, crisis, that they might start to de deprioritize dementia when we got back to normal. Um, and so the first thing that we did was we started putting out information on our website as quickly as possible in different languages, um, practical tips for people, tips on mental health, and resources that, our, that were coming from our own Alzheimer's associations, anything that we could find that would be helpful to people and make available. And one of the first things we did was we contacted our member in China, Dr. Huali Wang, who's also on our medical and scientific advisory panel, and we asked her to, you know, from the front line in China, tell us what you've learned right now. And she gave a presentation. It's, it's almost been watched almost 10,000 um, uh, times. It's, it's, it's amazing, really. It was the first bit of information that was coming out. And out of that also came a publication that was in The Lancet that really looked at how um, we're taking care of people with dementia, um, how we're helping with psychosocial support for them and for their families. And then we started with some of our member webinars and it was really important for us to, to build a community for our members to create a platform where they could access each other, not feel so isolated themselves, but also share what they were learning, share some of their ideas, um, help each other, support each other through some of the anxieties that they were having as they were trying to help their members. Those are some of the um, uh, examples of the themes that we went through. Um, and what we found, it was amazing to see their innovation and their absolute devotion to the people that they, they care for. And the, here are some of the themes that came out of some of those member webinars. And I won't go through all of them, but you can see that um, it was really about creating um, information and guidelines, not only for families and people living with dementia and their carers, but also for professionals who were working um, with people with dementia in a different way. Um, practical tips about how to help families um, encourage their loved ones to wear masks, um, to wash their hands, how to, to in, in remind them to do this, ways to think about answering their questions over and over and over again about why they can't go out. Um, real innovation around virtual support. I know we've, we've already talked today about some of the limitations around technology, but um, some of our members were actually using the telephone to call up and sing to people living with dementia. There's a lot of dancing going on in Indonesia. There's carers groups um, and um, a, a lot of advocacy. And I was really interested to hear what Christine said about um, some of the penalties that people were getting for being outside after curfew. And there's a lot of advocacy by our members about human rights, access to medication, access to support and protection from some of those penalties. Um, another thing that came out of this was a series of thought papers looking at some of these difficult decisions around um, some of the triage and access to care. Um, I know that Ada was, was mentioning some of this already. These are available on our website as well. Then we decided we wanted to go public and we wanted to start sharing some of this with um, you know, public facing. Um, and we've had a series of three webinars already. These are available um, as recordings and the slides um, on our website. Um, but some of the themes that started coming out about that were tips. Um, we had different uh, members regionally all over the globe share their tips. We did a, um, a webinar on future gazing, looking at um, what some of the impacts are around not being diagnosed about isolation, looking at whether or not there's been an impact on the biopharmaceutical industry um, and clinical trials due to COVID. Um, and our last webinar was on long-term care. And Adelaina spoke and at that one. We also had policymakers speaking. We had um, people providing care, long-term care in the community, talking about um, some of the challenges and solutions that they came up with to support people living with dementia and carers in the community. But really importantly, we had um, a carer speak about his experience of about not being able to see his mother, not being able to go in and visit her. Um, and he said he felt he was missing out on valuable time with his mom and missing out on the honor of assisting her through the journey that she was having at this time. So really um, heartfelt um, experiences by people. And we started to see um, concerns and themes coming out. And some of these have already been mentioned already today, this sort of excess 
um, dementia mortality in long-term care facilities, um, real worries about lack of PPE. I know a lot of this data is still coming in. And issues, um, Ada already mentioned today about issues around triage, um, issues around access to care, um, the, the sort of ageism, we had to really watch for that and advocate against that. And I know that some of the changes came in in the UK, for example, that carers were actually now being allowed to be, to, to go into a um, hospital with their loved one to actually um, represent them because it's, it's a terribly confusing, horrible experience for any of us, let alone if you have dementia. Um, also looking at the impact of, of not having a diagnosis, are people missing out on the opportunities to um, maintain their cognition and um, you know, uh, maintain their, their independence and function? And you know, this change in psychological support for people living with dementia and their carers, what's the impact um, of this new virtual way of, of, of um, supporting people, that lack of face-to-face -face care? Um, I know Peter mentioned this at the beginning. It's, it's very difficult when you can't read the same sort of um, uh, sort of body language. It, it makes it harder. And also, carers were losing out on some of the respite that they had, and, and so the, the, the carer burden was increased. And what's the impact of that? Um, and of course, there were so many issues around um, palliative and end of life care for people with dementia, both in hospital and in care homes that we were concerned about. And of course. We're a global advocacy organization. We were worried about if this was going to impact on the progress that we had made on the global dementia plans that we um, were advocating for, the national dementia plans um, that were already undergoing and um, being developed. And of course, we were really surprised that actually this whole thing is, has exposed gaps in uh, long-term care and health. And governments are really now starting to have to pay attention. And what we're finding is, Governments like Iceland and, and Germany, for example, are actually putting through launching their national dementia plan um, and, and making changes and adaptations for COVID and pandemic situations. And, and um, as Christine already mentioned, there's a lot of great work going on in Kenya. And for example, they actually said they want to reemphasize their, their support and they want to develop a national plan. And that will be the first dementia national plan in Africa, which is really exciting. So what happens next? Where do we go? And I, I think it's, it's clear that, um, you know, this isn't, this, we're still not out of the woods. It's still not over. And we think we need to continue to listen and to learn and understand um, what's, what the experience is. We need to listen to families, understand what the impact of them, uh, on them has been. We need to understand the impact of this isolation the trauma that's experienced by staff members who have been involved either in health or in long-term care, caring for people. Um, and also uh, in organizations and institutions that have been providing care, what have we learned and what can we do better? And how can we harness some of the innovation? Um, I know there are so many issues around technology. Some people have said that, you know, this new way of working has actually helped them meet um, the needs of more people. They've been able to reach more people, but how can we make it accessible to everybody? Because we, there are challenges, as, as Christina said. Um, encouraging openness. I mean, it's been amazing how just this, this website, Adelina, that you and colleagues have put together, there's been so much information that has come out um, with this. There's been a real um, openness about sharing data and information. This needs to continue. We know that regulators are now reducing some of their obstacles. We know that insurance companies in the Netherlands, for example, are enabling um, telemedicine to take place, whereas before it was a problem and they weren't allowing that to happen. They weren't covering that, and now they are. Um, and there's been regulatory easement on the biopharmaceutical industry, which is sort of enabling changes and uh, adaptation of research and development for new drug development. Um, and, and also, there's been a real strengthening, we need to strengthen coalitions. There's been so much work that's been done with researchers bringing in new evidence and people with dementia sharing their stories like Peter and carers and, and, and NGOs like our partners and our voices together are much stronger. And really, you know, the data that you give us, the stories that you share with us really fuel the fire of our advocacy. So we need to strengthen these coalitions and, you know, in this moment in time, this we have to, although it's been so difficult and we're still not out of it, we have to see this as an opportunity to advocate for, for lasting policy change. And, and that's about thinking about how we can 
integrate and coordinate long-term care and healthcare systems and how we can increase funding, how we can ensure to um, actually give better training um, to staff members and increase their pay and how we can think about you know, creating better legal frameworks around um, people's rights and also about um, their advanced directives end of life care and how we can provide better primary care. So I think we're coming out of this, we're gonna be in a new world, but we need to think about um, what new policies and new ways of discussing policy um, we can come up with so that we can have better care in the long term. That's me, thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Wendy. And um, yeah, so also thank you all for sticking to time. We've finished the presentations precisely at the end of the hour, despite the technical challenges, so well done. And uh, now we are open for the, uh, some discussion and I'll be monitoring the chat box to see if any of you has any question. If I just wanted to- Yes. Hello. Uh, hello, this is Hassan Tarani. I wanted to ask, can we get the slides so, and your link on an email? Because you put it on the chat, but if you send it as an email, it's much easier for us to get it. That's a good idea. So we're going to, we usually what we do, we post a video uh, and, uh, so we, and also the slides on the website. And that's a, because it's a big file, what we will do then is to email the link to the website where you will find the slides and the video. We will do that, thank you. Great, um, and do you have anybody, any questions for our speakers? So you can also of course comment with each other as we have speakers with very different perspectives and approaches. If anybody wants to start, I can't see any specific questions yet. Let me see. There's a lot of appreciation for all our speakers and uh, I don't know if you can all see, but- uh, Adelina? And, uh, yes, oh, hi. Uh, it's Liz, Liz. hi. Uh, hi. Um, that was all fascinating. Thank you, everybody. And I was particularly interested in the speaker who was talking about how we are learning um, from the experience of people with dementia during COVID to improve the care planning, compassionate care planning in our long-term care settings. I was wondering if um, they could say a little bit more. Was it Ada? I think it was Ada. Mm -hmm. Yes, so shall I? Yes, Ada, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so thank you for your question. So we, we have a few examples that are coming, coming up and also some anecdotes that people in care homes are sharing with us. So for instance, um, um, I, the other day, some, some people, workers in care homes were sharing with me their solutions to isolate in a compassionate way uh, people with dementia during the infection. And, and for instance, they come up with this idea because there are no guidelines. So we rely pretty much on people um, intuition and, and, and the and, and well, solutions that were, were put into place trying to make the best job possible. And for instance, in some care homes, what they did was to put um, masks on all people living with dementia because uh, this way, if they went out of the rooms and walk around, the risk of infection will be lower. In other places, what they did was to warranty that every person with dementia was allowed for walks every day, and there were uh, designated companions, like a member of the staff, will go with them and they will walk around the care home facilities accompanied by someone looking after their safety. In other places, what they did was to build designated areas in gardens, so people uh, uh, with dementia in care homes, they could also you know, have a space for them. It is very important for people with dementia to have a space, you know, to, to, to have their walks and, and, um, and try to alleviate also their anxiety with the confinement. And um, there is, I think I shared one paper that it's been published and illustrates an example of how a, in a care home, I think in Canada, they designed a, a care plan to isolate a person with a behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. All, all 
all of us who are familiar with different uh, dementia phenotypes will agree that isolating someone with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia is a massive challenge. And they, they explain what they did and they share their experience so other people can get inspired and use it. So we are learning bit by bit and it's been slow the way information is being shared because all this has happened so quickly. But I think that we need to try to make an effort to gather all these examples and share them so we can build on them. Thank you very much. There's a couple of questions that I think uh, maybe um, Christine, uh, you could uh, look at. So there's uh, the questions from Dorcas. Would you like to to ask your question or shall I read it? Um, I, I could touch on the first one, the one that I sure. saw. So the question, let me just read it out, um, unless Dorcas would like to do it. Dorcas? Hello? No, so I will do that. So the question is, uh, is asking about rural areas where people have no access to electricity and also concerns about partially blind dementia. And there's another kind of linked question, I think also in relation to, from Sarah House in relation to Kenya, which is about the possibility of doing some awareness training with police uh, about people with dementia and other mental health conditions during the outbreak. Yeah, um, thank you for very, um, very good concerns. And uh, thank you for highlighting on the possibilities of having no electricity in the rural area. That's quite a big challenge. And um, so here we are now not talking about electricity. We are talking about, we are not talking about internet. We are talking about electricity. So despite um, the issues of technology having to reach uh, for, um, um, uh, to reach to populations with internet, then we are not able to reach also to people in the rural areas. And so that's also something that we need to explore. How can we uh, reach them? But the advantage is that they have a phone. At least they can go to a place where there is internet. What is the best way? Is it calling them? Is it texting them? And I'm sure Alzheimer's Dementia Organization is already doing that and reaching out to those populations. In terms of um, that question was around uh, uh, awareness on police. That's very, very key. And uh, um, we, we can need something that um, we can do as a country, although the steps sometimes are usually uh, slow, but it is something that we can do in order to increase awareness and also reduce the violence and reduce uh, the strict guidelines that sometimes are not government guidelines, but individual uh, police officers who sometimes want to impose specific um, guidelines on individual people in the country. So while it is okay to um, follow government uh, um, uh, regulations, it's important to also increase awareness among the police. Thank you for that insight. Thank you. We've got then another question from Martin Knapp. Uh, Martin. Okay, just a quick question. I mean, it's for Wendy and for Gloria particularly, but it may be other people as well. And I think what they bought both uh, Gloria and Wendy, and thank you to everybody, so some really interesting presentations, thank you very much. But what you both were talking about was some of these uh, positive experiences that people living with dementia or carers are having uh, with the use of online uh, ways of engagement. Um, Peter was, you know, more mixed uh, view on that. But I just wonder whether maybe it's on the LTC COVID website or something. Some of this, some of these. <laughs> anecdotal bits of experience would be really helpful because I think with the CSC evaluation that Gloria and colleagues are working on that that will be great at some point we'll have a very full picture of what's happening but some of the early uh, lessons from this engagement will be really good and I'll just say one more thing quickly so a colleague I just looking to see I don't think Nick Brimblecombe is on the call but Nick is a colleague of, of many of us at LSE and she's found it much easier to engage with carers to do interviews for research purposes now than it would be normally. So, so you know, there are some positives, uh, and I think learning from that, I don't mean necessarily for research, I mean in general, would be great. So some way of, have a place on the LTC COVID website where people can dump those, uh, I, those experiences might, might be helpful. So. so the LTC COVID website will be very happy to publish any materials on this, and I invite any of you who would be able to write on these to please consider doing so. We 
we publish very quickly. We it's very light editing, um, so please uh, please do send. I, I agree, it's extremely valuable. I don't know, Wendy, uh, Gloria, if you want to mention something, and Peter. <laughs> Yes, yes, uh, very quickly, uh, uh, exactly as what Martin said, we are trying to learn everything because these are all new experience to us. So we are learning from uh, carers and also people with dementia about their firsthand experience of using this. And also, uh, uh, actually, we're planning research and in the sense that we are developing the online version of CST together with people with dementia and carers so that we have their input, we have their, their uh, participation in the development process. So I think uh, very happy to share uh, on the uh, LTC COVID website or elsewhere. Thank you. And Wendy? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, co I completely agree. And I think um, actually um, it, we were talking about this on one of our last webinars, this idea that actually we're, we're learning so much and we, we will continue to, to, to happen and we'll be interesting six months from now maybe more that we start to look at across countries and see where certain interventions were different and if some were more effective than others and if so why and um were some online interventions better were was there a combination of things that that, that worked um was it better when people were phoned was it better when people came to outside and, and did things at a, at a, at a care home and, 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 and worked through a window, we don't know. So I, I think I think it's a really good point, Martin. We have to start collating some of these um, so that we can start thinking about how we use that information in the future. And Peter, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and to unmute. <laughs> Hi, Martin, yeah, um, uh, please. Um, you know, I think some things lend themselves better uh, to uh, online technology than others and I think that uh, in my case um, uh, an appointment with a, a doctor uh, didn't really lend itself to a telephone conversation now I'm uh, I used to be a, a consultant in information technology I love uh, the internet I love I'm excited by the things that we can do online and we've also got to be aware that the generation of people who are, are not net savvy uh, sadly are dying off and those of us who are coming through now and entering the age of dementia have lived with it uh, and worked with it and are very tech savvy and I think the only thing that's stopping us is the universal availability of internet access and the cost of technology and also we've got to interest people to develop the right technology the technology that is uh, uh, that makes things easy for us, the technology that is uh, intuitive, uh, because I think that's what we lack. Um, uh, we couch our technology in a language that makes it difficult sometimes for people to, uh, to grasp easily. And uh, I think there's a lot of exciting work to be done, you know, uh, and uh, it's been very inspiring today, isn't it, the people? Thank you. So, Peter, we'd also be very welcome to write, to include your perspective on the website if you have another, I want to <laughs> put you on the spot in public, but we'd be very happy with your contributions. I know you blog and I know you, your thoughts, you have your thoughts on this. Thank you very much. So I'm actually going to, I mean, just to show the realities of internet and homeworking, I'm going to have to step down for about five minutes. Um, Wendy is kindly going to take over. I, I apologize, I'll be back very soon. You won't even notice. And I think the next person who wanted to speak was Maria Aurora. You had the comments. Uh, Wendy, if you want to read it, because Ma Maria Aurora cannot unmute herself. <laughs> um, and I will be back with you very quickly. Apologies. <laughs> okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take over. My accent isn't as nice as Adelina. Sorry about that. But um, this is a, a question from Maria. And um, she can't turn her mic because her, her son is homeschooling. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, read the question out. If anybody feels that they can step forward, please unmute yourself. Um, she says, I know of a local case, a person who is currently requiring mental health intervention. Um, he is COVID-19 positive. I do not know the details, but I know that he was ventilated because of his aggressive behavior. Can anyone comment on this, please? There is a fine dividing line in such a situation, more or less, as that with persons living with dementia. Thank you. Does anyone feel like they can respond to that? Any of our 
any of our speakers or any of our experts on the call today? No one coming forward. Has anybody else had a similar experience to this um, in clinical work in any way? No, I have no, no one stepping forward. I'm sorry. Um, um, Hi, uh, it's Malaysia here from Alzheimer's Society. Ah, great. Um, just to say, I know I work in our research and development department. We're a UK-based organisation, but I'm happy to take that um, comment forward to colleagues within the society and see if we can get a response to that. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Malika. That, that's brilliant. Um, and I'm sure there's a way for, for us to connect the two of you after this through Adelena um, websites, uh, through, um, email addresses, et cetera. So thank you for that. Um, right, next question. Then. Let's go to the next one. Um, from Robin Duffy, do you want to ask this question about CST online being done one-to-one -one or in a group basis? I think, Gloria, that should go to you. Yeah, uh, I, I also type in my answer because uh, we are trying both. Uh, we're trying both uh, group CST and also individual ones. Uh, the individual ones would be the easier one, uh, but uh, group, we are uh, testing it in a reduced uh, group size and it seems to be working fine. But uh, I think we need to have a lot of learning uh, in the development. Um. Now I can see Adelina's back. What, how about if I do the next question, Adelina? Yeah, please. <laughs> Let's you catch your breath after. Okay. So um, this is from Jarkas, um to Peter, actually. Peter, if, if um, I can ask you this question on, on his or her behalf. Thank you for sharing your personal experience. Could you please tell us whether there could be gender disparities when it comes to care for, for people living with dementia? Yeah. You think your experience is different? Yes. Well, yeah, that's just interesting. I've just dashed off a, a quick reply. All I can say is that in the uh, the webinars and um, internet interactions that I've participated in since lockdown, uh, male participants seem to be more numerous than female participants. Now, whether that reflects the disparity, uh, the gender disparity in uh, um, the people living with dementia, I don't know. Or whether that reflects uh, the, the, how people um, uh, by gender uh, embrace technology. Um, uh, I, I guess it's more that, you know, and, and I think we have some work to do uh, to, uh, I, if I just may digress for just a second, I volunteer in my local library, uh, I'm the IT guy. I, I introduced people, often elderly people, to computers for the first time. And my aim is to, to destroy those myths and to get rid of that fright of, of technology, to explain to people that it's something that they should welcome and not be afraid of. And I think we have a big job to do uh, out there to, to introduce that way of looking at technology to people so that they embrace it and see that it's just another tool that, that's useful to them. Sorry to go on a bit, but it's something I'm very passionate about. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, Wendy, for stepping in. Uh, I think uh, there was a question from Aida to me about uh, sharing these resources on compassionate isolation. And uh, yes, I'll be delighted to, to share that through LDC COVID. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, the, the website is um, it's updated very regularly. We There's a function to subscribe. So whenever something new is uh, put on the website, you get an email in the morning, on the morning if you're in the UK at 8 a.m., it depends on where you are in the world, but there's a daily email with any new posts and you have to be careful it doesn't go in your junk box. So we'd be very happy to share these resources on compassionate isolation. There's quite a few reports already about dementia. There's a new big international report that's being written by some of the people in this call. And of course, we're very happy to accept uh, more uh, articles, reports, experiences. We, it, this can be a personal blog. It can be a, a more academic type report. We're very open and we're very keen also to link up and share resources 
from others. As I couldn't see any other direct question at the moment, there's a few people who need to, oh, Malaika, yes, hi, Malaika. Hi there, I'm um, sorry, I'm, uh, one of my uh, roles at the moment is collating some of the latest evidence to inform our policy work. Um, in the latest LTC report, it says that um, there's no certain evidence that dementia itself increases the risk of COVID-19 infection or necessarily compromises the chances of survival. Um, and then there are some stats that kind of, um, oh, except in the cases of advanced dementia. So then the following examples, are, do they all relate to advanced dementia? So, um, for example, dementia and Alzheimer's disease being the most common pre-existing health condition. Um, I could email you separately if that's... Yeah, I think that uh, maybe, I don't know if Ada would like to answer, but, uh, and I think she's on mute at the moment, but I can, I can say that there's a combination of reasons why we're seeing so many deaths. And some of it may be because a very large number of people with dementia are living in care homes. So be the fact that care homes are places that are particularly risky. And then there may be other issues that are to do with, with risk and health risks associated with the underlying conditions or maybe some of the causes of dementia themselves. Aida, would you like to say a bit more? Because I know you've been looking at the evidence very closely. Yeah, just to add that, uh, for instance, when I reviewed the data that we have for this region in the north of Spain, where 41% of the people who died in total in the region had the diagnosis of dementia, I also saw in the data that um, people with dementia died 50% more um, if they were living in a care home. So there was double of deaths of people living with dementia in care homes that in the community. But I think that this, all, this may be due to the fact that people who go to live to a care home are usually in later stages of the disease, which means that they are usually older and they have accumulated more uh, comorbidity that makes, me, makes them more fragile and more likely to die of COVID or any other kind of infection. So this is, this is probably a strong variable explaining mortality. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, this is Asim. What I wanted to talk about is uh, what are we going to learn about the mistakes we made? <laughs> and uh, how can we plan to not to make the same mistakes? Because uh, uh, that is what perhaps uh, the research we should do and make a plan <laughs> that how, how don't we do the same mistake what we did and lost so many lives in the first instance. Well, I, I'm happy to take this one, but I'm also very happy maybe Wendy from the advocacy oh. side may also want to say something. And Peter, you may have your own views as well uh, as somebody who's uh, directly um, living with the dementia. So, so from my point of view, I'm thinking uh, the, on what LTC COVID is trying to do, what we've been trying to do was to raise awareness and make sure the politicians, the people who can make the decisions, take notice as early as possible. We started on the 20th of March. We've been very loud and very vocal using, uh, at least in the UK, we've been a lot in, we've managed to get out in the media, but we didn't manage that until in mid-April and by then it was already quite late. And I think as researchers that we have to do a lot of thinking about how we communicate what we know. And we, there were things we knew very early on that maybe we weren't, it wasn't very easy to communicate the usual channels that we use as academics. Those of us who are academics in this call is to publish in journals, but that takes very long. Something that we wrote with colleagues in England in March, even though it was fast tracked, was only published last week. So, you know, all this time has elapsed and of course none of those lessons could be read by the public. So we mean LTC COVID was created as a rapid means of communication, but it also we need to work I think with advocates to make sure we listen. And I'm very happy to say that the WHO, the World Health Organization, is, uh, is, has, uh, that, so the World Health Organization Europe has already done a technical guidance on long-term care that was published last week. And there is now one coming from uh, the World Health Organization Global. I think we'll, we're working on the draft at the moment. It should be out in the next couple of weeks, I think. So I hope that will help put some more pressure on governments and give them a bit more guidance because sometimes it's genuinely they didn't think about care. 
and uh, it took a lot of shouting for them to take notice and a lot of newspaper headlines to get them to change course but we are trying to condense all this learning into actions and policies that can be adopted so that there are any second waves any future outbreaks and also this has taught us a lot about the things that we really need to improve about our care systems and we need to address because this has shown a lot of the weaknesses that we've been living with already for quite a long time it's just that nobody was really managing to get any attention on it. So I don't know, uh, Wendy, from ADI's perspective as an advocacy organization. Yeah, I think, I think that's such an excellent question and something that we're all really grappling with. Um, and I think, you know, we need, to, we need to really listen. We need to listen to what has happened to people on, on, on very many levels, from very personal stories. I mean, it's very important that we listen to people like Peter and hear what his experience was and learn from that and, and learn from people that are providing care and learn from people that are family carers. And, and, and so there's, there's many layers to this very complex onion that we need to unpeel. Um, but I think that we need to look at what has worked well, what didn't work, and then we need to sort of um, coordinate some of these lessons learned. Because I think there are many facets to this. I think Adeline is absolutely right. Long-term care is very important and has been ignored for a long time. There's also, also health aspects. And so, um, you know, the greater economy and the impact that it's had and what that means for how much money there's going to be for us to spend in different areas. So I think there has to be a sort of coordinated response to this and there has to be many voices in that. Um, and, and, and a good example is some of these task forces that have been put together, for example, in Canada, that's looked at different facets of health and um, social care and other aspects of, of the government that are together with a coordinated response to this. And there are also people living with dementia on that task force, as well as carers. And then, so they're trying to learn in their country what works, but also pulling lessons learned from other countries. So we need to keep talking and we have to uh, Peter, would you like to comment on what you think needs to be done? Well, uh, yeah, once again, that is an interesting question. My <laughs> wife would tell you that I never learn. <laughs> uh, look, there, there is an army of us, of people living with dementia out here. Please use us. Use us as a vehicle to help you to deliver your message. Um, uh, people, people tend to listen to us uh, because if they, many, most people, well, one in three people know someone who is living with dementia. And so they understand uh, where we're coming from. They also know we have no ax to grind. We're neutral. So please, we're a, a resource, a free resource. Use us mercilessly. Thank you. And I think Martin Knapp, you were raising your hand. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just a quick point. It picks up something that Wendy said, or two things that Wendy said. So I think uh, you know, learning these lessons, and I think particularly in relation to people living in dementia and carers, that, that we would hope that at some point there'd be a lot of reflection on what's happened and what lessons will be learned. But I do have my doubts as to whether governments have much of an appetite to do that, because what they're going to learn is that they've screwed up. Um, and uh, therefore, I think, you know, it probably is for organizations, hopefully like ADI or at least you know, some non-governmental organizations um, could perhaps t take a lead. I know they're, they're all strapped for resources, but could take a lead on that reflection, I think. Um, and, and the second point, I think, is that, that you use the onion layer analogy. I'm going to use the rose petal analogy. I think Gloria showed us a beautiful Hong Kong rose. I think we need to sort of, it, it's not so bad. Onion always makes me feel like something sour. I think what the the layers of care are much sweeter than that um, but we do need to look at all those different layers and how they interconnect and what the lessons are that we can learn from that so I think and, and this you know the, the initiative that Adelina and colleagues are taking with the LTC COVID uh, website and so on is fantastic in that respect so I think what we can do is harvest some of the material that's being shared here uh, for that kind of reflective inquiry. Thank you. Can, can, I, can I come back? <laughs> Yes, uh, go ahead, Hassan. <laughs> uh, yeah, what I wanted to say is that why, as a provider or as a user, we rely on others? We should do ourselves. Like, say, for example, COVID-19, we knew end of January, beginning of February. What did we prepare? We didn't do it either. We like to blame others. 
but we should do ourselves first. We should get ourselves prepared. Don't rely on others, is my view. Yes, it, uh, I think it's been a difficult to also know how to prepare. And I think we've learned a lot about this disease while we were in the middle of it. And of course, in the UK, a lot of preparation was assumed to be buying toilet paper initially. And then we became a bit more sophisticated on the ways, on all the other things we needed to sort out. Apologies for that joke, but it just reminded me of what was happening back in February. Wendy, I think you probably had a more <laughs> uh, serious comment than myself. <laughs> on what Marcia said, I think you're absolutely right, that um, it's revealing the hard truth. It's sort of like the end of that movie in The Wizard of Oz where we pulled back the curtain and we see that actually, you know, there's trouble. And, um, you know, but I think that the, the, the almost the global dementia action plan provides us with a framework that we can work with. We just have to start having those conversations in a different way. Um, using what we've learned um, to, to, to sort of advocate. I absolutely agree with you that, um, you know, it's, it's up to global organizations like ADI to, to really push and advocate for, for, for this change. But we can't do it without the help of all of you. So be behind me. <laughs> Thank you. There's a comment from Dee Brennan. Would you like to, to unmute or, or if I may to read? It's Hello. No? So I can read it. Uh, so it says, in Ireland, our over 70s who are cocooning are now emerging slowly into society. But unfortunately, the same opportunities are not available for people living with dementia in long-term care, assume that means in care homes, nursing homes. It would be very interesting to see how other countries are lifting the isolation for people with dementia in a safe manner. And I think that's a really one of the big questions that, that, that has stayed during this. And I don't know, Aida, if you'd like to comment a bit on this, on how to make it, how to support and make it safe for people in care homes, in particular living with dementia, to be able to participate back in society. Yeah, so my response is that I don't know, because I think that there is no experience on how to do this the same way that there is no previous experience about how to isolate people with dementia safely. But my concern is that um, care homes around the world are just too scared of new uh, spikes and new outbreaks. So I think that they are going to be very uh, strict about uh, lifting any, and very careful about lifting any measures. And this can be very harming for people living with dementia. The other day I heard about uh, a new outbreak that was controlled uh, here in the north of Spain in a care home. And it was very well controlled, but one of the measures that came into back into play after new cases were detected was a total ban on visits again. So, and, and, and the residents are no longer uh, allowed to go for walks within the facilities or around the building. So, um, so I think that there are maybe, yeah, this is actually a field to develop how to how to be more compassive not only in isolation but also lifting the the quarantines and the and the lockdowns also on care homes this is a very relevant topic i think and i was wondering if any of the other people who are in the call would like to comment i know we have a few people who are listening and have been very quiet who already have have experience from their countries on on the ways in which the, for example, care homes are beginning to open again and how they're finding as safe as possible ways to facilitate that. Uh, anybody else like to, to share some experiences, examples of good practice? Oh. Mm. So I'm not hearing much, but we also had um, in the first, I think it was the first webinar, there was a presentation from Lee Fei Lo from Australia. So, and you can find it if you look for the webinar, the first webinar video um, from LPC COVID, where she was also talking about the experiencing of reopening and also the enormous importance that that visitors, family members have in care, and quite how often we have also ignored the fact that people in care homes provide care. So, so it's not just that it's a visit that somebody comes to have a cup of tea and leaves. Quite often, people who who come to the care homes are relatives who will spend quite a long time there and maybe help with, for example, the meals, 
and help make sure that the person feels comfortable. And when you suddenly close those opportunities, it means that the care staff who are already quite stressed probably and run because of the lockdown and the pandemic, and, and quite often we have care homes that are short staffed, do have to do even more because the families are no longer providing the care that they used to provide. And I think it's been something that maybe hasn't been given as much attention and we need to think that some regular visitors are actually an integral part of the care ecosystem in the care homes and maybe more effort needs to be put into training them in infection control and how to use PPE safely and how to ensure that, that they can behave in the same way that the staff member would do. So I don't Sorry. see, yes, <laughs> come in. <laughs> Can I add to that? Because actually, in order to be able to send you the presentation, I have to cut a few pictures, but I would like to share them um, you know, I don't know, whenever possible with the rest of the group, because I had a few examples about how some care homes have enabled uh, visits, and they are very beautiful. So for instance, there is a care home in Argentina that has created the Hack Car Times, Hack curtains, um, for those of, of you who are not familiar, are these kind of plastic curtains with 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 uh, oh, hacks. arms, yeah, hacks. And then you know people can hack uh, their relatives in the care home, and it is really nice. And there is another care home. I am able to. I have the picture, so I'm able to circulate them later. But who have uh, designated spaces, safety. Um, spaces that comply with protective measures in either in open spaces or or in kind of tents that have been placed outside the facility and the, the um, partners in care are wearing masks and, and PPE and then they are of course the the car visits that we all have seen in the news so visitors and families uh, can drive into the care home and and they can see their relatives and, and the window uh, visits also through windows. So there are many examples. I'm happy to circulate all this. And uh, I got a bit distracted with this uh, very interesting conversation when now we've gone over time. Uh, just a quick point from Terry Loom was saying that in many Asian countries it's quite common as well to have private domestic hel uh, helpers come into care homes and also be part of this system of care. So I'm going to end here because it is now uh, over time. The slides and the video will be shared uh, sometime this week. Thank you so much for these very, very rich discussions, these fantastic presentations. And remember to share with us anything you'd like us to, to, to put on the website and, and any learning that you think can be shared with others. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the week. Next week, we will not have a webinar and we will be announcing the one for the week after soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.